Welcome back to Black Magic Craft. It's spooky season, and I wanted to make a creepy diorama. I started with the stars of the show, the models. The big Lovecraftian horror creature is from this video sponsor, Crippled God Foundry, and the boy is something made by Vault D that I found on my mini factory. My initial vision was to simply have a set of stairs going to a basement with the boy at the top and the monster below. All of the rest of the details and the actual layout of the scene was yet to be determined, so building the stairs was an obvious place to start. I laid out and made stringers using some basic popsicle sticks. I then cut the stair treads from coffee stir sticks. I busted out my tiny table saw from Proxon, which I rarely use, but I knew this project would involve quite a bit of cutting of wood and MDF, so it seemed worth grabbing to make those cuts quicker and easier. To mount the treads, I cut short lengths of a very thin square stock balsa wood, which I was able to glue to the stringers. These would support the treads and make assembly a bit easier. Gluing the thing together was still a bit of a challenge though, especially when it got to doing the second size. After much fumbling, I ended up with an imperfect but very usable set of miniature stairs, which I mounted into a frame. The base of the diorama was a wood canvas from the dollar store, and the walls were thin MDF sheets, which were also from the dollar store. I made a post and beam for the main floor using a larger square stock of balsa wood. I followed that with a second one at the front of the scene. I knew that this floor structure would end up completely covered on top and barely be visible unless you really looked at the underside, but I wanted the scene to feel as realistic as possible. So I went through a ton of extra effort to create a proper floor framing construction, which included balsa wood floor joists and diagonally planked subflooring. Once this phase was complete, I started focusing on the main floor walls that would encase the stairwell. Before assembling this L-shaped wall, I cut out a basement door, saving the cutout piece to use as the door itself. To make my life a little bit easier, I decorated this wall section before attaching it to the main structure. This included adding door trim, baseboard, and chair rail. I filled the area below the chair rail with some pre-textured EVA craft foam that did a great job of imitating wainscoting. This sheet was, again, also from the dollar store. It came in a pack with a few other textured patterns, and I've been holding out and waiting for the right opportunity to use it. At this point, I knew I wanted a carpeted floor, but wasn't quite sure the best way to do it. So for the time being, I simply glued on a piece of construction paper and decided I would try painting it to look like carpet. And if that didn't work out, I figured I could apply something else on top. To create doors, I cut strips of that same construction paper and layered it on in a classic four panel design. I cut a tiny slice of a round skewer for doorknobs, which wasn't ideal, but was better than anything else I had on hand. I jumped back into the basement and covered the walls with some caulking that I stippled with a damp brush. This would give the very smooth MDF a bit of texture that would better imply old concrete. After that dried, I realized that the upper floor tops would end up looking a bit unfinished and I wanted to add some old fashioned crown molding. Unfortunately, I had no suitable material for this, so I resorted to cutting a square stock strip from a wider piece of balsa wood and then hand carving that strip into a triangle wedge piece. If you're wondering why I didn't just rip the balsa wood at a 45 degree angle instead, it's because that little table saw doesn't have a tilting blade. It just does 90 degree cuts. This ended up working out much better than I anticipated because balsa wood is so soft and easy to carve and it doesn't split like other craft wood does. And putting it in place really finished things off and started to give this imaginary home some character. My joints weren't too bad, but I still needed to clean them up a little bit by filling the gaps, which I did with the same caulking that I already had out from earlier. It was at this point that I decided to go harder with the details. I was really liking the way this structure was looking and I didn't want to cop out and make it super simple. So I decided to add a nice window. I used a couple MDF laser cut window frames from shiftinglands.com, gluing them together to create one large picture window for the living room. This frame was then cut out from the MDF wall using a rotary cutter and glued into place. The window was finished off with some decorative turn of the century style trim work, which I also copied over to the doors. Now thinking about the monster again, it had no chance of standing in the basement. It would be way too tall once assembled. 
I considered scaling it down or using one of the other crippled God Foundry monsters that was smaller, but I knew in my heart this big monstrosity was what I wanted. So I'd have to find a way to reposition his pose to fit. Having the monster sit on the floor was the answer. I was able to cut off the limbs and reposition them pretty easily into a sitting position. There's something incredibly satisfying about reposing a physical model like this. When you get your cuts and join points just right and the pieces naturally sit in place, it's a wonderful feeling. I also thought that having this nasty creature just casually sitting was somehow even creepier than it's standing. It's just so chill waiting there for whoever comes downstairs next. I got the joints attached pretty well, but to get them fully blended, I would need to do some sculpting. I've always found green stuff to be difficult to use because it's so hard. And I usually use Milliput, but it's on the other hand, very, very soft. Mixing the two together is a fairly common practice, but something I've never actually tried before. So I figured, hey, this would be a great opportunity to try it out. And I gotta say, it did create a consistency nicely in the middle of the two putties that was easy to work with. Sculpting in some detail that matched the original model was fairly simple, and overall, I was pleased with how this creature was looking. Speaking of this creature, now's a great time to tell you about the company that made it and sponsored this video, Crippled God Foundry. My friends at Crippled God Foundry make some of the best fantasy-themed miniatures for tabletop gaming on the market. This October is an exciting month for them as they're celebrating their anniversary and offering up both a full fantasy release called Horrors of the Far Realm that is packed with Mind Flayers and Cthulhu Mythos monsters, as well as a sci-fi release called First Contact, loaded with mechs and heavily armored warriors. This is their first time offering a sci-fi bundle, and you can get both of these sets bundled together for a discounted price. And as I mentioned, it's their anniversary, and as a thanks, they're gifting their subscribers two full releases for free. Subscribers will get to choose an existing set from 2022 and also get the very cool Monstober Eldritch Horror set which includes 30 more Cthulhu-themed creatures, one of which is this creepy wormhead lurking horror thing that I'm using in the diorama. As if these four sets weren't enough reason to sign up this month, new subs will also receive a free welcome pack with terrain and minis, as well as a throwback collection of character minis. If you sign up for the fantasy sub, you get a fantasy welcome pack. If you sign up for the sci-fi bundle, you get a sci-fi welcome pack. Join both and get both. So if my math is right, that means in October, you can get six full sets for the price of two. Pretty good deal. You'll obviously want to check this out for yourself, so I'll put a link in the video description that will take you to their page to sign up for all of these awesome 3D printable miniatures. Now back to my Monstober build. This scene was ready for some paint, and I started this by airbrushing on some black surface primer. Trying to do this one with a brush and getting all those little nooks and crannies under the floor would have been a severe pain in the ass, so I was grateful that I had an airbrush and a spray booth set up to do it. I did a light highlight with some white, but instead of ink like I usually use, I used a creamy, slightly yellow airbrush paint. I was then able to move right from the highlight into painting out all the main floor and basement wood with this color. The warm off-white was perfect for this and greatly resembled the dirty white paint you often see on old trim work and in basements as an attempt to make them slightly less grim and unwelcoming. I have distinct memories of basements growing up having the concrete walls painted with a gross minty hospital green. So there was no question as to what color I'd be using on this scene. I wanted the main floor to give strong granny vibes, so I painted out the upper walls with a rose-colored red. I then attempted to paint carpet, which I knew likely wouldn't work, but I wanted to try it, and it didn't look too bad. Doing a stippling of a few different brown and beige tones over a dark brown base coat gave a somewhat shag carpet sort of look. Not great, but it was a valiant effort that I could just cover up with something else later. Now jumping back to the walls. Every good granny living room needs ugly striped wallpaper. So I set to work masking off stripes with tape, which I could then paint with a lighter rose pink color to give that lovely two-tone rose scheme that so many grannies seem to love. A quick tip if you're gonna be doing something like this. Before painting your secondary color, apply a thin coat of your original color over the tape. This will steal all the edges and any paint that does manage to get through and under the tape is going to match the color beneath it. This way, when you move on to your secondary color, it won't bleed under as much, giving you a much cleaner and crisper separation of the two colors. With a little touch up on the trim work, this quick striped wall pattern looked quite nice. 
I did want to blend the paint job together, give it a bit of grime and shadow, so I mixed up a brown oil wash and went over everything. I made this one less pigmented than I might normally because I didn't want to darken it up and bring down the main colors too much. Once it was dry, I wiped off the surfaces with a makeup sponge and some paint thinner, and everything had a nice but not overwhelming dirty patina. I wasn't satisfied with my carpet paint job, so I decided to try something different. I created some carpet patterns in Photoshop and printed them out on plain uncoated paper. The tricky part would be cutting one out accurately and getting it glued in place with all the walls and paint job already done. I didn't want any ugly gaps. To avoid that problem, I made a multi-piece template using construction paper. With this method, you cut out different areas of the floor with individual pieces and layer them. This lets you get things more easily lined up to all of the angles and indents that the layout might have. You just tape all those pieces together to create one final shape that perfectly matches your floor. And then you can transfer that over to your material and cut out a perfect piece that fits like a glove. This worked awesome, but I wasn't really happy with the carpet pattern itself. So I went back to the computer and and made one with a floral pattern. This took some effort as I couldn't find an appropriate image to use. I only found these little small sections of pattern that I had to expand myself, lining up all the little pattern pieces and using generative fill to complete it, but it worked well. And this gaudy floral pattern carpet was just perfect for the scene. With my flooring finalized and in place, I could attach the open basement door. I made some hinges using construction paper, which I painted brass before gluing the door in place. And since I had already utilized my home printer, it got me thinking about what else I could use it for to give this scene some life. Printed out some paintings in a few different sizes and created some picture frames with construction paper that I painted. This was really fun to do, and the detailed paintings with their little frames was such a nice addition to the scene. It really started to make it feel like a believable home. I also printed out one of those oval braided multicolor floor mats that my grandparents always had growing up, and I glued it to the basement floor. The basement as well as the living room would need some objects to fill the space. One thing I really wanted was a hot water tank. I cut part of the lid from an old Crayola marker to use as the body of the tank. I found a round bit with some pattern on it that was a similar diameter, which I glued on top. Then I drilled two holes in it and placed some soft wire to create the hot and cold water lines. This was then painted and weathered, and I added some more printed stickers to create a lovely little hot water tank, which I glued in place alongside some early 1980s wall calendars that I also printed out. I 3D printed a shelving rack and painted it an ugly green. I think every old basement has one of these. I printed out some vintage wrapping paper patterns and rolled them up because every basement storage shelf has some rolls of wrapping paper on them. I wanted some cardboard boxes and thought a simple way to do them would be to print off an area of sticker paper in an appropriate color and then wrap small cubes with it. This was taken one step further with some teeny tiny fragile stickers. To go along with the box that was obviously full of Christmas decorations, I grabbed the smallest bottle brush Christmas tree I had and glued it in place slumped over the boxes. I also printed out some small labels that I wrapped around onto a wooden skewer to cut little cans. This idea was sound. The labels worked great, but wood was definitely not the best material for this as it was tricky to cut them this small. I think using balsa wood or plastic rod would have been perfect. Adding a handful of little objects to the shelving rack made it look real and used. On every creepy basement needs a deep freezer. I figured out a crazy easy way to make one quickly. I cut a foam block and wrapped it in glossy white sticker paper. I used a thin strip to make the lid, which I also wrapped in the sticker paper and attached to the top. This alone looked pretty damn good, but I went ahead and added some rust effect as well as some general grime. This freezer hasn't been cleaned in a while and who knows what kind of weird stuff Granny is storing in there. With the basement elements glued into place, I could move my focus towards the living room. I 3D printed and painted a bunch of furniture, including a TV stand, CRT television, and VCR. I even printed and painted some very small and difficult to handle VHS tapes. A pink couch, an old lazy boy, and an oak coffee table were glued into place. At this point, I thought it would be nice to add some ugly curtains. And it turns out that that piece of carpet that I had printed earlier and threw in the trash could actually double as curtain material. I cut and folded the paper to look like drapes and it looked so good. I had to find a way to mount them with a curtain rod though. And this meant drilling through the layers of paper with a pin vise. Delicate task, but it worked. 
For the curtain rod itself, I didn't have anything appropriate. All my straight round material was way too thick, so I opted for some wire. To make it straight and stiff, I clamped one end into a drill and used it to twist the wire. This twists the wire into a straight line and makes it much stronger. This could then be bent and cut into shape before painting and mounting. Since the small connection points of the wire ends wouldn't be strong enough to glue the curtain rod directly to the wall, I took the extra step of drilling some small holes in the wall so the rod and curtains could be properly mounted. I wanted some potted plants and used a little tiny toy whistle to make a tiny pot. The plants themselves were these lovely printed and laser cut plants from Gamers Grass. These are so cool and so realistic looking, I absolutely love them. With the setting complete, it was time to paint and install the main characters. I painted the monster a light creamy pink which I covered with purple and red oil washes. Once the oil was dry, I cleaned it up a bit and mixed up a gross bloody effect using dollar store five minute epoxy and some alcohol inks. Originally, I wanted to use this goop just on the mouth and the chest, but I noticed it would probably look really good if I coated the entire model in it, giving it a disgusting wet finish. I glued it in place using that same bloody epoxy mix and as it cured, I used my brush to pull some strands of the hardening epoxy to create some drips and strands of ick. The last object to place was our poor little dude who was about to meet this creature in Granny's basement. The piece was done, but I wanted to add a title plaque to it. I thought about 3D printing something, but I recently bought myself a Cricut cutter for some other hobbies and used it to print out a vinyl transfer of some small title text. And that's a wrap. I had so much fun making this. I allowed myself to take the time to put in a bunch of fun details. And honestly, I could have kept going with those, but at some point I did have to stop myself and just move on and call it finished. I love how oddly nostalgic this diorama feels like the creepy kind of unsettling nostalgia that unlocks some core childhood memories that you had previously forgot. Well, I hope you enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed building it. If you did, hit the like button, let me know in the comment section and share this video with a friend. If you wanna pick up some tools or supplies for your own hobby needs and support the channel in the process, be sure to check out blackmagiccraft.ca. There I have an essential equipment page where I link to stuff I use regularly and shopping through those links helps fund the production of videos like this. And last, if you really enjoy the stuff I make and you get a lot of value out of it, the best way you can help me keep doing it is by supporting the channel on Patreon. I'd love to have you as the newest member of the Black Magic Craft Fellowship. That's it. That's all. Don't go in the basement, kids.